Welcome to the 40th episode of the New Ventures podcast. I'm your host Sanjoy Sanyal, the founder of Regain Paradise, a boutique climate consulting firm and a visiting fellow at the Cambridge Judd Business School. I host the New Ventures podcast to help people starting new climate initiatives learn from existing practitioners who are already progressed in their paths. The question that we'll discuss today as COP27 opens is to speculate what would happen if there is no sufficient climate finance for the low carbon transition and to discuss this we have a very special guest dr jaydeep prabhu from the cambridge judge business school and a world leader in frugal innovation welcome jaydeep thank you sanjay it's a great pleasure to be with you i'll try and quote some data the climate policy initiative which is a think tank which tracks global climate flows says that the amount of climate finance has been steadily increasing but is nowhere near enough finance to limit warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade there are actually two issues here one is the shortfall of commitments from the developed countries to the developing countries which is the climate finance goal itself but there's an additional point which is that there is a gross mismatch between the pledges and the commitments made by the private sectors and actual money flowing in climate finance now for a person who has studied his whole life the practices of frugal innovators what is your reaction when you hear statistics like this yeah great question to start with sanjay i mean my initial response when i hear these stats is to say great you know from the perspective of frugal innovation because this is what frugal innovation is all about it is innovating with constraints or under constraints and these constraints can be financial they could be time they could be any kind of resource based on my work over several years now my conviction is that when the going gets tough that's when the frugal innovators get going that's these resource constraints necessity adversity these are the things that get the creative juices flowing for frugal innovators that's when they can really tap into human ingenuity to think of either reusing old ways of doing things or recombining old ways of doing things or coming up with new ways of doing things faster better and cheaper so that's my initial response we don't have the money great that means we'll have to think it will also mean that we won't waste money we don't have resources great that means we'll have to think it'll also mean we won't waste resources we don't have much time fantastic because that will also get us thinking in a very creative way now it's not a foregone conclusion but my initial response to the stats you quoted and the issues you raised lack of time resources money you have studied this problem initially in the emerging world and there are enough examples of companies who have tackled really tough problems when they have been faced with these constraints right jedi yes sanjay in fact a great deal of my work has focused on the private sector both in developing countries and the developed world there are plenty of examples in both contexts of companies that have risen to this challenge but let's take some examples from the emerging world first and i'll take two i'll start with a, a company called selco from bangalore in south india my hometown where the founder and ceo harish hande for some years has been working on solar solutions for people typically living off the electricity grid in urban slums or in the countryside and who typically use things like kerosene for lighting or cooking or heating his story is very interesting because he realized early on that it wasn't the technology per se that was going to solve this problem it was really understanding the context in which the people he was targeting were earning and spending what their current behavior was what was the exact set of problems that they were trying to solve and importantly coming up with an affordable solution that worked for them and once he had understood that then he went back to the drawing board to come up with a solution and that's when technology became part of the solution one of the things he realized was that for a typical client of his let's say a fruit cart vendor who's in the informal economy earning and spending on a daily basis she might be able to afford something like 10 rupees a day 
but she could not pay a monthly management fee or have direct debit or take a loan because typically she wouldn't have access to a bank. And so his solution was to have local people in the community who he trained to maintain the batteries, panels, and lights actually offer this as a pay-as-you-go service on a daily basis. Even to do that, he had to do a lot of work because a lot of the people who he would train from the local communities might not have access to a bank and get a bank loan. So he worked with the bank to give them loans, which he would guarantee. And then with the loan, they would acquire a store. They'd get the batteries, panels, and lights. They would charge the batteries during the day and then rent them to people like the fruit cart vendor for, say, 10 rupees a night. You know, it's uh, solutions like that that I have been very inspired by because I think they really address the problem at the grassroots and then they come up with creative solutions. I'll give another example from a different sector and a different geography, this time Kenya and this time mobile payments, which was actually introduced in Kenya in 2007, 2008, not by a bank, but by a mobile phone company, Vodafone subsidiary, Safaricom. And there, again, it was very interesting because the banks had noticed, of course, that mobile telephony was taking off, but they had been slow to see the potential of innovating that space. But the mobile companies had the drive to actually come up with new services they could offer their new customers. And so Vodafone went into a slum in uh, Nairobi, in Kibera. They had an initial plan of using a kind of payment software on a phone to help people repay their microfinance loans. But when they started to test this out, they realized that actually the microfinance agents were not too keen on this. They preferred to go door to door and see their clients. However, the people from Safaricom noticed that local people had already figured out solution, you know, a, a quick fix to exchange three minutes that they had or extra minutes that they had with each other. They could exchange them on their phone, uh, like sort of texting it to each other and use that as a form of currency. So the Vodafone people, the Safaricom people, then created a software and a system to formalize this. They worked with the Central Bank of Kenya and they introduced M-Pesa, which became a game changer, not only in Kenya, but in many other countries in Africa and elsewhere, enabling people who are outside the banking system to get into the banking system on the lowest rung of the ladder and then climb up the ladder. And importantly, this was done very frugally because they didn't create any new assets. They took what was already there. People already had mobile phones. They were used to texting each other. They had corner shops in their villages that could act as the agents where they could cash this e-float for money and so on. So just two examples from the emerging world you know, that I've studied over time that bring out these aspects of how to address really tough problems in a resource-constrained environment. It is interesting because the, 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 the example of energy that you gave in India and the example of mobile money actually joins up together in this propagation of the pay-as-you-go energy model. But we'll talk a little bit more about it, but I'll move on and ask you that there's also evidence from the Western world that has come up in your books that the approach of throwing money does not always spell success, but is actually often counterproductive. Yeah, absolutely. There is a saying that work expands to fill the available budget or work expands to fill the available time. And that's unfortunately true a lot with large corporations because large corporations tend to have, you know, big budgets. They tend to have big R&D teams. They tend to have long-term projects that they're working on. And then what that does is it creates a mindset where the engineers and scientists in these corporate labs are trying to achieve the perfect solution. And achieving the perfect solution, often that is technology-led from a technological perspective, not necessarily from the perspective of the eventual users or beneficiaries of that solution. And that can take time, it can take money, but it can also result in pretty big failures. Why? Because often, even if you've started off by trying to address a market problem, because the solution takes so long to achieve, you might come up with a solution only when the market has already shifted and preferences have changed. 
And so you could end up with a kind of white elephant product, one that was designed for a customer that no longer exists, and one that actually then has taken a lot of time and money to come up with. And so even large companies now are recognizing the pitfalls of this kind of very expensive, top-down, bigger-is-better model of innovating and of industrial activity. And what you have studied is that there are examples of large multinationals embracing frugal innovation. So maybe if you can give us a few examples of that. Absolutely, Sanjay. So, you know, we have written, that is my co-authors and I, a couple of books about frugal innovation in the private sector. The first book was very much about how this was done in emerging markets like uh, India, China, various African economies and so on. That was the innovation that was very much about what Western multinationals going to emerging markets could learn from their emerging market counterparts. But then after that book came out, we began to look at this phenomenon in the Western context, particularly in large Western companies, which for pretty much the whole of the 20th century had followed this bigger is better, top down, technology led model of R&D and innovation for the most part. But we're now starting to feel the pressure of competing with in emerging markets, their emerging market counterparts, but in the West with startups that had perfected the kind of lean startup, frugal way to innovate faster, better, cheaper. In our second book, Frugal Innovation, which came out in 2015, we looked at large corporations across sectors, from automotive to pharmaceutical to health, education, medical devices, industrial goods, fast-moving consumer goods, banking, and we then studied a large number of large corporations that were trying side by side with their old industrial model of R&D to also compete with startups and their emerging market counterparts in how to do more and better with less, how to innovate faster, better, and cheaper. So that second book is full of examples of these large companies. So we start with, for instance, the automotive company of Renault, which initially created an affordable car for Eastern Europe, working with Romanian engineers, the Dacia. And initially that was intended for emerging markets, but then they saw that it was doing very well in the West. So they began to then systematically adopt these principles of frugal innovation and frugal engineering not only in their Western R&D centers, but also partnering with their R&D centers in countries like India. And, you know, I can go on. In healthcare, pharmaceuticals, we looked at how GSK was mimicking biotech startups by acquiring them, but not just acquiring them for their technology, acquiring them for the way they organize their teams so that that could be replicated within GSK and GSK could move from having big teams working on fundamental science to smaller, more nimble teams that were working on specific therapeutic areas and so on. So yes, our second book is full of examples of large corporations across sectors adopting these principles of frugal innovation. So Jaideep, one of the things that was already clear in your second book was the topic of circular economy. And we know, and you referred to this in the beginning, there's a lack of resources. But companies were already addressing this for purely economic reasons. Could you give us a few examples of this? Yeah, absolutely. So out of the six principles that we identified in that second book on frugal innovation, which was all about Western corporations adopting these principles for the West, two of them, two of the six, were more explicitly climate-related. This was actually a big motive for us to do the research because we realized that a lot of Western companies, large corporations, had realized that it was a strategic issue for them. It was in their interest to start thinking about being frugal in terms of the resources that their products and services depend on, most of which were finite and where there was competition for access to those finite resources. You know, you take an IKEA, for instance, which depends crucially on the availability of timber, which is a finite resource. There are only so many forests and trees in the world. And then increasingly, there's competition for that limited resource of timber. Other companies, particularly from emerging markets, 
would be competing with IKEA for access to that timber. It became strategically important for a company like IKEA to then secure their access to timber in the future. Now, one way they could do that, of course, is by thinking about that supply chain and actually vertically integrating back or working with farmers to ensure that there were forests, you know, where there was captive timber being grown. But another is to become circular. So instead of being linear in that you take resources from nature, you make products with them, furniture, which consumers buy and then dump again in nature, that's totally wasteful and it's simply not sustainable. You would want to move to a situation where you reduce, reuse and recycle all the materials that go into your products, your furniture, if you're IKEA. And one way to do that then becomes you move to from a transactional, we'll sell you stuff, to a contractual, we'll give you a service model, a leasing model. And you see that being adopted by carpet and flooring manufacturers who work for office buildings, for instance. Same thing, company like Tarquette, the French flooring company, has been trying to do that uh, in their business with office buildings. You see this increasingly now with automotive companies where they will try to lease the car to you so that they retain control of physical asset and then they can recycle all the elements in that. Battery manufacturers are moving towards that as far as possible because of a lot of the rare earths that go into their batteries are very precious and there's going to be competition for access to the pure natural elements. That's one principle. And we call that principle create sustainable solutions. That's what the large companies seem to be doing. Now, many of the large companies we talk to said that because it's in their economic interest to rationalize their supply chain and reduce their footprint, they have done that. But in many cases, their customers, people like you and me, when we consume their products in the home, we have a somewhat unsustainable, wasteful uh, set of habits, consumption habits. So people at Nestle has pointed out that often people like you and me, we might boil a whole kettle to make a cup of tea or coffee. People at Unilever pointed out that we might take 10 or 15 minute showers when we could take a five minute shower. Now, how to influence or shape consumer behavior? Here, a lot of companies are drawing on behavioral principles, uh, nudged policies, uh, using digital technologies like apps to help us monitor our behavior and to optimize our behavior so we reduce waste in the home. Whether it's consumption of food, we reduce uh, consumption of energy, water, and so on. So those are the two core principles of the six that really relate to the climate crisis directly. Dave, thank you. I think that makes it very clear. What I found interesting was the process by which companies did it. And one thing that stood out to me was this issue of collaboration, collaboration with your lead customers, collaboration with other startup companies. Maybe you can explain a little bit of your, the principles you unearthed a little bit more in detail to help us understand this. You're absolutely right there, Shanjai, that these were two of the six. And the other four principles are very much about the process of innovating. The first principle is one we call engage and iterate because it reflects what the large companies are trying to do by in keeping up with uh, startups. Startups who have perfected the art of the lean startup, where instead of coming up with the perfect product that will take a lot of time and money to develop, they work with one customer to come up with a minimum viable product, which they co-create with the customer to develop. And there is a lot of iteration there in tight loops uh, with a lot of feedback. And then once they've come up with a solution that satisfies one customer, they take it to others. We document how large companies are trying to do that within these large structures and processes that they typically follow. The second process principle is linked to how they manage their assets. And we call this principle flex your assets. So large companies have a lot of physical assets. They have their factories and supply chains and so on, fleets of vehicles, all that kind of stuff. But they also have human assets, their R&D teams. So we look at how large companies are changing the way they manufacture, moving to batch manufacturing in pharmaceuticals continuous manufacturing, and so on, where you can manufacture drugs in a single 
mobile kind of factory which can be moved from place to place in a shipping container, for instance. We look at those kinds of physical ways to flex your assets, but we also look at how companies like GSK are flexing their human assets, like their R&D teams. Often they'll acquire startups, biotech startups, not so much for their technology, but for their culture and their approach. So GSK, after acquiring biotech startups, tried to move to an R&D structure where instead of having very big teams working on basic science areas, they had smaller, more nimble teams working on specific therapeutic areas. The third process principle is one that we call co-create with prosumers. So prosumers are consumers are not just passive recipients of products and services from companies. They're more actively involved in the socioeconomic process. Many of them are makers. They go to make spaces and they tinker and they come up with prototypes and so on. So companies like Ford, the motor company, has partnered with Tech Shop in Detroit and it sends its engineers to the tech shop, which is a make space, one afternoon a week just to tinker. And about a year after they initiated this whole approach, they found that their engineers were not only uh, happier in their jobs, their morale had improved, but they were also more productive. They were generating more high value patents as a result of this process. And the final process principle is one where large companies are partnering with startups often, with smaller companies to innovate faster, better, and cheaper. So we give the example, for instance, of Barclays Big Bank in London that partners with fintechs in a big accelerator that they have in Myland, where they house about 10 or so of these global cutting-edge fintechs for 13 weeks. And in that time, the fintechs are improving their solutions, but they're being mentored by people from the main bank once a week. And that helps them understand how banking works, all the regulations, etc. But it also helps people in the main bank think about how they might incorporate this solution into the bank. And at the end of the 13-week period, these fintech startups pitch to a team from Barclays, and then the team makes a decision of whether to incorporate that solution in the bank, to invest in it, or to pass it on to someone else. So those are the four process principles. I'll try and sum up this section of the podcast where we learned, in my opinion, a few things. One is money is valuable, but it's not always the panacea. If you throw money at a problem, it does not mean that the problem will be more easily solved compared to situations when innovators get together and innovate against constraints. And I think you've brought out examples of that and you've brought out principles of how people achieve that. But I would take away two interesting things from what you said, Jaydeep, which is one is the issue of the diffusion of innovation. I'm so happy that you brought up Harish Hande's example right at the beginning of this podcast. I'm sure Harish Hande inspired a whole generation of entrepreneurs from the Western world who then went to Africa to solve the problem of energy access. Because you brought up Harish Hande from your hometown in Bangalore, we also have to talk about Simon Bransfeld from Cambridge who set up this company called Azuri, or Christopher from the Imperial College of London, who set up the company called Bbox, UK-based companies, who then went and tried to set up the ecosystem of providing energy access, a very tough challenge in very poor countries of Africa. So that's one thing I think is interesting from a diffusion of innovation perspective. The other, of course, is following your lead customers. You talked a little bit about pro-consumers that you understood the Western companies working with. But I'll link this up with the example that you gave of Vodafone in Kenya, where they found the inspiration for innovation, if you may, from the existing practices in the Kibera slum. To me, that is also an important thing because it allows us to observe how people, how, let's say, a Maasai tribe would adapt to climate change and then derive inspiration of climate adaptation. That's kind of how I'm taking away this section. What you have said, Jadeep, is that I think innovators and entrepreneurs, if challenged, can do anything. It's the others that we need to worry about. Of the others, one very key member of the others is the issue of public policy. How should policymakers work to support frugal innovation? So you're absolutely right, Sanjay, that we've talked about the private sector 
relying, especially large companies, relying on big budgets and long-term projects. But you could argue that the public sector suffers from that even more so. And in fact, the world is replete with examples of the public sector and the state engaging in these white elephant projects with with huge amounts of money are spent and long time periods uh, elapse before something eventually happens, if at all. So following those two books that we wrote about the private sector and the frugal innovation book, last year published a book called How Should a Government Be? where I focused on precisely this issue of frugal innovation in the government, for the government, for the public space, but also how the government should think about regulating and cultivating frugal innovations in the economy. And there we start to look at, I'm actually there, it's, uh, I'm the single author there, so it's me. What I do there is to actually argue that governments too can figure out how to do more and better with less. Not just can, but they must because they are actually working with public money and they since they owe the taxpayer and it's taxpayers' money that they are spending. Um, so one of the many things that I explore there is how the state can adopt some of the approaches that the private sector has adopted to develop things faster, better, and cheaper because the state, after all, also delivers uh, solutions and services to its citizens. In many countries, health, education, these are things that this comes under the state's purview. In some emerging markets, the state also owns energy companies and other state-owned enterprises. So there's no reason why the state cannot also adopt these principles of frugal innovation. And I give examples, one from India that you'd be very familiar with, of the Aadhaar, the unique ID, which was done I think very frugally, it was done within a budget of about $2 per ID, per Indian citizen, and was done pretty quickly. In about five years or so, a large number of Indians got access to this unique ID linked to their biometrics. And it was done at a huge scale. So we see lots of examples of the state doing it itself. But we also see examples of the state enabling others to do it. So we talked about M-Pesa earlier on, and a lot of people have written about that whole story from the private sector perspective, from the perspective of Safaricom that went to Kibera, saw what the local practices were, came up with this solution, faster, better, cheaper. But in this latest book, I write about the role of the Kenyan central bank in enabling that innovation to happen because they played a key role. Initially, Safaricom went with their proposal to the central bank. Now, the central bank could have simply said to them, hey, you guys are not a bank. Go get a banking license and come back. Now, that would have probably killed the project right there. Or they could have washed their hands off it and said, oh, you guys are a telecoms company. Go to the telecoms regulator. Instead, they actually engaged, and they engaged quite early, proactively. A bit like the engage and iterate principle, they engaged with the company early, and they said, okay, here are three issues we have, concerns we have. One, are you actually robust? Is this platform going to work or not? Second, will it comply with money laundering uh, regulation, international standards? And third, is it legally a banking service you're providing? Because then you would have to get a banking license. And they very quickly, with a consultant and the help of Safaricom, got answers to these questions that they were satisfied with and gave Safaricom a letter of no objection to uh, enter the market and then monitored them, which is also key. So we look at a lot of principles. Another example I give is of how cities like Barcelona or Boston engage with the local makers and tech companies and universities to be able to come up with often digital solutions for citizens in the local city, in the local communities. So I think public sector suffers from a lot of these challenges, but there are many examples of the public sector being able to adopt these principles of frugal innovation to do things faster, better, and cheaper, either itself or by enabling others to do that. Great, Jody. Public policy is, of course, absolutely critical, but my topic is climate finance. And one of the things that I found very interesting in your book is the example of challenge fund, the idea that you proposed for moving public money. Could you 
elaborate on that a little bit, please? I think challenge funds are a very powerful way of getting people to focus on particular big, wicked problems like climate change or aspects of the environment, environmental collapse. And these have been used very successfully at different levels of government. We could start with cities. And I give examples in my book of at least two cities which have done this very effectively. I mentioned Barcelona. In Barcelona, the mayor engaged with an existing network of local fab labs, which are make spaces, that had come out of the local architectural university in collaboration with MIT. Uh, they encouraged communities within these labs to focus on making solutions, often Internet of Things solutions, for local challenges around, could be linked to certain sectors like construction, could be linked to automotive, could be linked to household appliances. So out of that, out of these challenges, uh, one very concrete solution that came out was something called the Smart Citizen Kit, where the local community in a tech shop, in a fab lab, basically came up with a device, an Internet of Things device, to help individual citizens monitor pollution in a better way in the city. So typically, a city like Barcelona would contract with big companies like IBM or Cisco, come up, buy this very expensive equipment, about 40,000 euros per unit. They'd buy a few tens of units and place them in different parts of the city, typically in the park, so they could claim the city is cleaner than it is. But the people in the fab lab realized that, hey, that's actually a dumb way to do this. It's much better to come up with potentially hundreds or thousands of tiny sensors, devices that are very low cost, that you know they can make in the fab labs, sell on the internet to people in the city who would just buy it and then install it in their homes. They could just uh, put the sensor outside their apartment where it would read real time things like nitrogen levels, carbon dioxide levels, noise, temperature, sunlight, send that data real time to a USB stick connected to their computer, which would then send this information to a central server that would process the information from hundreds of these devices and then send it back to you. So you could actually monitor if you had asthma, you would know why you had an attack on a Thursday evening and you would know what to do about it. You could complain to your local council at the city level. Then you see these kinds of challenges at the regional, sometimes even at the federal level. If you look at the U.S., for instance, you have these grand challenges often led by DARPA. DARPA has done this very effectively. They could be to from everything from how to come up with a better vehicle for combat to dealing with a new disease like chikungunya or to figuring out how you would put a rover on Mars. They issue these challenges and they engage people from companies, large and small, from universities, maker communities. And then basically they get a very large number of people to creatively come up with solutions faster, better and cheaper, which then they can select to scale. I'm very impressed by the ability of different levels of government and the public sector to creatively engage people at different levels, organizations of different sizes, to be able to come up with solutions in a more bottom-up way, through more frugal way than in a top-down kind of heavy-handed way that often results in expensive failures. I think the examples of challenges to come up with solutions to what you call wicked problems is great. But uh, one of the things that they, which I found very fascinating in your book was this education endowment fund, again, for a social problem, right? And the way that enabled solutioneering. Do you remember that at all? Yes, of course. The education endowment fund is itself a part of a whole network of what are called what works centers in the UK. And these what works centers actually came out of a prior development, which was the behavioral insights team, which was the application of nudge techniques to government doing its own work faster, better and cheaper. For instance, tax collection through the proper clever wording of letters that were sent out to, say, doctors who might have an additional source of income that they don't typically report or don't report on time. 
So the nudge unit made a lot of progress, but then they realized that what was also needed was some kind of system whereby evidence that has been collected over time, either through academic or other sources, on how best to address certain social issues, whether it's in areas like education or criminal justice or health and so on, you could actually create a kind of repository. You first of all document exactly what we know about very specific interventions that a policymaker can make or a government can make. You document the evidence and then you have a simple metric or a kind of dashboard which would enable not just the policymaker, but the civil servant or the person in the school or in the prison to inform decisions on a real-time basis. So the Education Endowment Fund focuses on education. And what they've done is they've come up with a very simple system of codifying what we know about the efficacy of interventions in education. And the art stake, the outcome that they are focused on, the single metric, is how much advancement you make, how many months a particular intervention increases your learning by, or how quickly you can achieve that particular skill as a result of the intervention. So that's their outcome metric. And then they assess any intervention based on how effective it is in terms of adding, improving learning outcomes, speed of learning outcomes. Uh, they look at the cost of associated with that intervention. And they look at how strong the evidence is in support of that finding. And they basically trawl the world of RCTs and other studies to come up with this kind of dashboard. And it's made available then to anyone in schools, uh, principals, teachers to adopt. So for instance, maybe a school is thinking about uh, what is the benefit in terms of learning outcomes of adding an extra teacher in a class? Or what is the drawback of doubling the class size? And they can very quickly refer to the website to see what is the evidence on that particular intervention, uh, what is the cost of that intervention, and how strong is the efficacy or effectiveness of that. So that approach, I think, is very powerful to help with the public sector make educated, informed decisions. And certainly this could be applied to climate and energy policies as well. We have seen the Behavioral Insights team nudge people towards, for instance, insulating their lofts in the UK, which is a very big issue. But even better would be to have a kind of dashboard like the Education Endowment Fund has to help people, empower people essentially in all kinds of contexts to be able to take informed decisions about how to reduce their footprint. RCTs, those of our audience who do not know it, uh, Jadib refers to random control trials. It is obviously very expensive to do them. But so if you have a database of the results of various random control trials done all over the world, it will be of very big use to, to future policymaking. And that's, I think, what you're referring to, Jadib. The example that you're given to me resonates so clearly with adaptation. You know, what works in adaptation? We have to build up a database around this. We could obviously talk about this for hours, but, you know, I'll move on. And one of the issues as we talk about frugal innovation is that private investors, especially the venture capitalists and the private equity firms coming from the digital era, want to move in large amounts of capital into single deals. Now, is that compatible with your way of thinking about frugal innovation, especially in a climate context? That's not really compatible with what I've been studying and writing about, because this is a continuation by other means of that old bigger is better uh, model. The whole idea, it seems to me, is that particularly in these kinds of digital platforms, there is a huge first mover advantage. And so this is like a gold rush where basically the investors rush in to try and create one monopolist that will dominate that particular business and sector. And they'll dominate it not only because they capture the customers, but often these are two-sided platforms. Think about Uber. It's people who want to use the taxis and it's the taxi drivers. By trying to scale very rapidly, Uber can essentially have monopoly power over both sides of the market, the taxi drivers and the customers. And a lot of the money that is being pumped into 
Uber would be pumped to really buy out, you know, bribe in a sense, customers by charging them less initially and the drivers by giving them more initially. But once you have monopoly power, that monopoly power can be misused in various ways, including by raising prices for customers and reducing benefits for the taxi drivers. The other aspect of those models where they pump money in to get the winner-take-all kind of outcome is the data aspect. They would stand to gain over a period of time a huge database on not only in the case of Uber, say the drivers and the customers, but you would also have a lot of data on transportation use and also credit card, debit card use. And that data can be sold or be mined for all kinds of other insights, making it highly valuable. And so I think it's not compatible with frugal innovation from the perspective of the principle of trying to do more and better with less. Here, they're trying to do more and I would say worse with more. <laughs> but I also think that it's potentially dangerous from an economic and social perspective because I would say that generally speaking, monopolies are a bad thing because they give people monopoly power, which they can then abuse. And in the case of digital platforms, we're also seeing the misuse of data. There are issues around privacy and security and regulators, unfortunately, in various parts of the world, have been relatively slow to keep up with some of these negative externalities. So that's my take on that question. Very frank, Jaydeep. I think this is very important. We will move on. And one of the things that I want you to understand a little bit more in detail is you gave a number of examples of maker labs. But in general, I think one of the things that have come out in your last book is the ability of individuals courageous individuals to make a difference. And especially in the context of climate change, I think that's very important. Maybe you want to talk a little bit about that. Individuals are what actually motivate teams and then organizations and then societies to change. In my books on the private sector, really both of them, whether it's about emerging markets or the developed world, they're really about individuals within companies, whether they're startups or large corporations who are driving change. Of course, they find allies. They can't do things on their own. They have to create communities within their companies that will make the change happen. That's the private sector. The same thing with the public sector. In the government book, How Should a Government Be?, which came out last year, the stories that I tell, there are people behind those stories. Uh, the Aadhaar, we know, was famously driven by Nanda Nilekani and a small group of administrators that he selected and a somewhat larger group of cutting edge technical experts who in many cases volunteered to build the backbone and write the software. So that's a very large federal level project in a huge country like India. But a lot of the smaller cases, if we go to the M-Pesa case and the central bank, there are a few key members of the central bank team who drove that change who bucked the trend of just washing their hands off something new or stalling. In the city examples, I haven't talked about Boston. Boston has been fascinating. The mayor there, who was a five-term mayor, Tom Menino, he actually was a very traditional sort of politician. He didn't believe in technology. He believed in what he called urban mechanics, literally walking around the town, talking to citizens, finding out from them issues like, oh, there's a broken manhole or a missing manhole on... 52nd Street, fix it. He then created a small team in the mayor's office called the Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics, which was housed by a few technical people who came out of universities like MIT and Harvard and Tufts, who really were entrepreneurial but understood the public sector context. And that's a little engine of innovation within Boston. They identify problems in the community. They come up with frugal solutions, often digital, that they test, they get evidence. And then if they find that something is working, they will pass it on to the relevant department to scale. So it's always individuals that are driving change. And often these are people within companies. They could be entrepreneurs in their startup, but even in large companies, you have entrepreneurs, people who are driving change within the context of a large monolithic, often process-obsessed bureaucracy. Moving from the power of the individuals to the power of large corporations, how should large companies engage with entrepreneurs and society as a large in this era of climate change? Yeah, so 
I think a common theme throughout my books has been this issue of how the large and the small can work together. And you can see this both in public public partnerships or private private partnerships or public private partnerships. A lot of the private sector now is full of examples of large companies partnering with startups in order to innovate faster, better, cheaper. And the reason is that the innovation process, you know, you could think of it as having two aspects to it. There is an initial fuzzy front end where experimentation is important, where you've got to try a lot of different things, often fail at a lot of things before you find something that works. And then there's a second more systematic phase where having identified one or two candidate solutions, you then scale them. Now, the first fuzzy front-end experimentation bit is best done by startups. They're more agile. They're more frugal. There are many more of them in any society. They can do that very well. Then they reach a point where they've come up with a solution, but then they don't have the resources to scale. That's where the large companies can come in or large organizations can come in. It could be from the public sector as well. They have the resources to really scale these successful experiments. So we saw this, I think, in very spectacular fashion during the pandemic. And you see in the pandemic, a lot of startups or even university labs coming up with candidate vaccines. They map the genome, they figure it out very quickly. They figure out what the virus looks like. Then they figure out what a candidate vaccine might look like, what features it may have. They can test it in the lab very quickly. But then at the next phase of really scaling it, they'll struggle. So that's when they then pass it on to a large pharmaceutical company. So Oxford partnered with AstraZeneca, BioNTech partnered with Pfizer, and so on. And then the big pharmaceutical, which has mastered the art of doing clinical trials, they have all the resources, they have everything in place, the software and the teams and so on. They can go through the regulatory process uh, at scale. And then they can manufacture at scale, they can distribute at scale. And then actually, in some cases, the state stepped in again to help get the vaccine in arms. If you think about the UK, the NHS played a huge role in that. So I'm a big believer in this importance of partnerships between the small entrepreneur that can move fast, the large company that can scale, or the government that can scale. And I think we need a lot more of that. Certainly in the climate context, if you think about COVID as a small scale preparation for the big scale problem we are going to keep facing over the next few years of climate change. We will need those kinds of partnerships in spades, big time. Jadip, you've covered a lot of ground here. I will try and wean out a few things. To me, the example that you gave about um, Kenya's central bank engaging with Vodafone, Safaricom to test the innovation in the context of real customer adoption is actually extremely fascinating. That type of example where policymakers engage with innovators to understand the innovation in some more detail before they can take decisions of go, no go, or approval, no approval, I think is an extremely critical thing to understand in the context of climate change. You know, I think about many examples like microgrids or energy storage or demand side energy pricing and so on and so forth. And I think that second point that you make is just collecting the evidence and helping policymakers do this in a more informed way, almost a central repository, if you may, of international evidence as, as it comes in, how to adapt to the climate change is very critical. The other thing, of course, is the importance of individuals standing up. And I think individuals and entrepreneurs, whether in public organizations or private organizations, do, will have to stand up. And finally, of course, is the issue around large companies what you call public-public partnerships, public-private partnerships, and the partnerships between entrepreneurial organization and large companies. That, to me, is the final key message of what you're saying. I agree with all that, Sanjay. And, you know, you mentioned experimentation and the regulatory sandboxes approach. I think that's really key. It's going to be key with climate change because we don't know what works we don't know what will work in which context and how it's likely to scale. But we have to try out various things. And of course, 
various people are trying out various things. Now, then the question becomes, do we have some kind of systematic way of collating this evidence, presenting this evidence and getting others to adopt it? Because you don't want to have to reinvent the wheel. So I think this is where regulators can play a very important role by creating a space, a sandbox, where people can try out experiments, collect the evidence, and then get permission to scale in a way like the FARICOM did with the Central Bank of Kenya, in a way that uh, the UK's Bank of England has been doing with its fintech regulatory sandbox, in the way that the UK has been doing with autonomous vehicles, and so on. So I think that's a key point that bears kind of re-emphasizing. Right. Thank you, Jaydeep. And if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way? I'd be delighted to hear from people. The best way to contact me is by email. It's j.prabhu at jbs.cam.ac.uk. You can also follow me on Twitter at Jaydeep Prabhu. So those are probably the two easiest ways to get in touch or on LinkedIn. That might be a third option. With that, thank you very much, Jaydeep. Thank you, Sanjay. It's been a pleasure to discuss these really important and very interesting and thought-provoking issues with you. Thank you. On that note, thank you very much. Follow me on LinkedIn, Medium, and Twitter to get fresh international perspectives of what people across the world are doing in this decade of climate action.